<clears throat> that car, that 1912 Renault Type CB Coupe de Ville that is featured in James Cameron's 1997 Titanic film, really was on the Titanic. It wasn't just placed there so that Rose and Jack could get it on. In real life, it was the only car listed on Titanic's cargo manifest. And there has been so much talk about this car and whether or not it can be found. Can it operate if it is found? Well, I'm here to tell you that the real story isn't about that car. It's about the couple who owned that car. The man's name was William E. Carter. He was from Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, and he was rich. He didn't work hard for his money. He was born into it, and it seemed like a lot of good things came easily to him. One of those good things was his wife. Her name was Lucille. She was said to have been one of the most beautiful women in her native Baltimore, really among all of the society women of her day. And lucky old William snatched her up and was able to call Lucille his own. She was traveling on the Titanic with William, and so were their two children. Now, the entire family made it safely off of the Titanic. They were all rescued. And in the immediate days following the disaster, both William and his wife were heralded as heroes in the press for the brave actions that they took after the Titanic hit the iceberg. And if that was the entire truth about their story, I wouldn't be talking about it here, because that's boring as hell. That's just history. But this is hot mess history, where we dig into the dirty side of history. The stuff that they don't typically put in people's obituaries. You know, the whole, so-and-so was a great man. Yeah, not on our watch. Today, we're going to take a look at the story of a Titanic family who traveled first class. They had a lot of money, but were led by someone who didn't seem to have a lot of morals. This is the story of the wealthy and well-connected William E. Carter and the lovely Lucille, and the real truth about what happened to them on the Titanic and after the Titanic. This is a story that proves that having it all isn't always all that it's cracked up to be, and that even though we get the story straight from the horse's mouth, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the truth. You're about to hear a first-hand account of one couple's heroic actions, a story that was printed and read all over the world that turned out to be only partially true. And boy, oh boy, were there some consequences to pay for the parts that were lies. Let's get into it. But first, if you like these videos about the most scandalous people from yesteryear who make Ty's Hot Mess History a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time that I upload content. And please hit that thumbs up to support this video for free. Whether you are watching or listening, thank you for letting me be a part of your day. Now, on to why you are here. When William E. Carter and Lucille Stewart Polk got married in Baltimore in 1896, as far as anyone would have guessed, they had a bright future ahead of themselves. It was a big, beautiful high society wedding at Franklin Street Presbyterian Church. Some of the most affluent people from Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., New York City, and of course Baltimore, were in attendance. William had inherited a massive fortune from his father's coal and iron business, so the newlyweds didn't have to worry about money. And that's half of the battle with marriage, right? Financial problems are one of the leading causes of divorce. But money was not a problem for the Carters. Because not only did William come into the union with his daddy's money, Lucille had a little bit of family money too. And by little, I mean a lot. Speaking of, let me tell you a little bit of background information on our characters in today's story. Ladies first. Lucille Stewart Polk was born on October 8, 1875. Her mother was Louisa Ellen. I wasn't able to find out a lot about her, except that she was from Kentucky, and she gave birth to two other children besides Lucille. Lucille was her middle child. Louisa Ellen had three children in five-year intervals. A son named Anderson in 1870, then Lucille in 1875, then another son named David in 1880. 
It can be very difficult to find information on women from so long ago. Their significance in that period came from being married and their attachment to men. So I can't say that I'm surprised that I was quickly able to learn when she was married and how many children she had. Lucille's father, on the other hand, has a bigger historical footprint. His name was William Stewart Polk. He was born in Washington, D.C. in 1827. In his early teen years, his family moved to Baltimore, and he started working as a clerk for a shipping company as soon as he landed in the city. When he was 26, he joined the Navy and worked as a paymaster, basically performing payroll tasks for the Navy. From there, he received an appointment to the Virginia Military Institute. When the Civil War broke out in America, he served in the South. After the Confederacy lost the war, he returned to Baltimore. By 1866, he was working in the insurance field as an underwriter for John S. Selby & Company. In a very short time, he became a partner at the insurance brokerage firm. Then he married Lucille's mother in 1869. And one more thing about Lucille's father that helped to add some credibility to her standing in society. He was a descendant of the 11th President of the United States, President James K. Polk. So, through her father's bloodline, Lucille was a great-great-grandniece of President Polk. This piece of trivia was thrown into several articles about Lucille throughout her life. She was often noted as being from a wealthy Baltimore family and a descendant of President Polk. So there she was, a girl from a good, solid, rich, and well-connected family. What more could a girl need or want to get along in society? Well, Lucille had one more thing that worked out in her favor, and it's that she was said to have been strikingly beautiful. If there's one thing that was mentioned more than her blood relation to the former president, it was that she was really pretty. She was noted as being one of the most beautiful blondes of society and having a really great figure. Her beauty was written about so often that it seemed to be a statement of fact and not an opinion. Lucille's name was always in the society pages. One of her earliest newspaper mentions was in 1894 when she attended a society cotillion, an event that would have given her and her fellow participants a chance to display their etiquette and social dance skills. It seems like she would have been everything that a guy like William Carter could have ever hoped for. Speaking of William, let's get into a little bit of his family history. His mother was Cordelia Miranda Reddington, and, as is usually the case, there wasn't much available for me to learn about her beyond the facts that she was born in Vermont in 1846, she was the second wife of William's father, and she had four children, including William. He was the only boy. One of the three girls, whose name was Grace, died after only two short months of life. William's father was William Thornton Carter. He was born in England in 1827. When he was a young man, he married his first wife, Jane, in 1854. They had two children together, a girl named Annie in 1855, then a boy named Charles in 1858. Six years after that, tragedy struck the family when his wife, Jane, died in 1864. Following his wife's death, later the same year, William Carter migrated to the United States. He made a name and a fortune for himself in the mining industry. Then, four years after arriving to the States, in 1868, William Thornton Carter married William Ernest Carter's mother. William Ernest is a topic of today's story. He's the one who traveled on the Titanic. He was born from this union on June 19, 1875, in Philadelphia. And just to be clear before we go forward, even though William, who is the main subject of today, is named after his father, I never saw that he was named or referred to as William II. That will matter a little later on. The father, William Thornton, went on to become an iron and coal baron, owning and operating mines in Carbon County, Pennsylvania. He amassed a fortune large enough to ensure that his next few generations could live quite comfortably. And that is exactly what happened 
when William Thornton Carter died suddenly in 1893. Our subject, William Ernest Carter, inherited a huge sum from his father's estate and then was set for life. So I want to make it clear that from this point forward, I am on to the main characters of the story. When you hear me say William or William Carter, I'm not talking about the father who made a fortune and passed away in 1893. The William of our story attended the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a member of Delta Psi fraternity, and he would have graduated in 1896. But college was too boring for William, so he dropped out and pursued polo and hunting instead. While his family didn't get to celebrate his graduation in 1896 as they had planned, William gave them another milestone to celebrate, his marriage to the beautiful and highly sought-after Lucille Polk. The couple had met the year before, in the summer of 1895, and it was love at first sight. By the fall, their engagement announcement was public. Then they held an extravagant society wedding in January of 1896. William now had a wife, and he would soon have a family for which he'd have to provide. But he didn't have a career. But he didn't need one. The same year that he got married, he also turned 21 and was able to get his hands on the money that his father had left him. Now, it seems like there are two kinds of people who inherit massive family fortunes. One kind does everything that he or she can to increase the family wealth whether it's working in the family business or forging his own path, but the point always being to keep the wealth flowing for the next generations. Well, William was the other kind, that kind who focused more on spending money than earning it. He didn't work in the family business or any other business for any long period of time, but he really didn't have to. He did a little work as a stockbroker, but William's adult life was dedicated to his sporting endeavors, his social clubs, and his family, seemingly in that order. You'll understand what I mean by that in just a moment. For now, I'll put it this way. William's loved ones and friends called him Willie. Before our story ends, his beautiful wife will be calling him William, as well as some other names under her breath, I'm sure. But like most romances, the Carters started off splendidly. Let me share with you a few details from their fairy tale wedding, as they were written in an 1896 edition of the Philadelphia Inquirer. Quote, The floral decorations of the church were the finest seen here this season. Garlands of lilies and roses halfway up the aisle separated the members of the families and special guests from those only invited to the church ceremony. The bride, who for three seasons has been considered one of the most beautiful girls in Baltimore society circles, looked lovelier than ever in her gown of heavy white satin. A feature of the breakfast was a large silver loving cup, which was one of the groom's presents to his bride, and which went the rounds, the health of the bride and groom being drunk in bumpers of champagne. This afternoon, Mr. and Mrs. Carter left for Rosemont, the groom's country seat near Philadelphia, where the first two weeks of the honeymoon will be spent, after which they will go to St. Augustine, Florida, to remain until next spring. Next summer, they propose enjoying a coaching tour through England. End quote. So you see that they had a honeymoon that lasted for half the year. When you don't have to work, you can do that. Life was pretty easy for the Carters. Getting back to real life after their honeymoon meant that William would make his rounds in his clubs, the Bryn Mawr Benedict's Polo Club, the Philadelphia Country Club, the St. Anthony Club, the Pennsylvania Society Sons of the Revolution, and the Ratner Hunt. That's why they called him a club man, because of all of his exclusive club memberships. And Lucille was pretty much doing the same thing as William, only, of course, her clubs were made up of society women. The couple moved from their first home on Rittenhouse Square to their country residence in Bryn Mawr. It was called Gwedna, and Lucille would host fabulous dinners and receptions there. She was good at putting on a party, and her hosting skills made the Carters a big part of the in crowd in their society set. 
the biggest names from the busiest cities would often come and sit at their dinner table. These parties kept William and Lucille Carter's names in the same rotation as the Vanderbilts and the Astors in the society pages of the newspapers of their day. Being a beautiful wife and an amazing hostess, dressing exquisitely, and being a mother was Lucille's entire life. She became a mother in 1897, the year after they got married. The Carter's first child was a girl who was named after her mother. She was also Lucille Polk Carter. Then three years later, in 1900, they had a boy. He was named after his father. He was William Carter II. And these are the four who sailed on the Titanic. Mother Lucille and daughter Lucille. Father William and son William. Now very quickly, the year before the Carter family boarded the Titanic, Lucille was in a bit of a scandal. From the time that she was a debutante in Baltimore, her stunning fashion choices were written about in the newspapers. And in 1911, one of her outfits was causing quite a stir. It was written that she was at the Bellevue Stratford Hotel wearing silk green tights. Now, I admit that I am not a fashion historian. I don't know exactly what that means or why anyone would have cared, but it was a big deal to those people in 1911. I'm imagining pale tights like the pink ones that are worn for ballet, only these would have been green. But I don't know what else she was wearing with them. Maybe she was only wearing the tights and nothing else. If that were the case, I would completely understand the scandal. But thankfully for Lucille, she was able to prove her innocence to the fashion police because she wasn't even in Philadelphia when that nasty green tights rumor got started. As the Evening Sun reported, the Carters were in England where they had taken a house and would not return to the States until later that year. And besides, Lucille Carter didn't even own a pair of silk green tights. So there. Anyway, let's get the family on the Titanic now. The year that Titanic made its maiden and final voyage was 1912. The Carter children were adolescents. Their daughter Lucille was 14. William II was 12. The family had been living in Europe since 1907, and every year they would return to the United States to live in their mansions in Philadelphia and Newport during the spring and summer months. In 1912, their original plan was to return to America on the 3rd of April. They had made reservations to travel on the Olympic. The Olympic was owned by White Star Line, the same company that owned the Titanic. The Olympic was a sister ship of the Titanic. And the Carters made a last minute decision to ditch the Olympic for the newer and larger and more luxurious Titanic. This change in vessels also changed their travel date from April 3rd to April 10th. William and Lucille Carter's names were such a fixture in the society set that their return trip to the United States was written about in the newspapers. And then, on April 10th, the two Williams and the two Lucilles boarded the Titanic at Southampton as first-class passengers, of course. They held ticket number 113760, which gave them access to cabins B96 and B98, for as long as the Titanic stayed afloat. But there was more than just the four of them and their luggage. There was also Mrs. Carter's lady's maid, Augusta, Mr. Carter's manservant, Alexander, the family's two dogs, an Airedale Terrier and a Pekingese Spaniel, and the Carter's chauffeur, Augustus Aldworth. After all, somebody would have had to drive that brand new Reynault after they got off the ship. Augusta, the lady's maid, and Alexander, the valet, or valet, depending on how you pronounce it in your part of the world, the manservant, had a separate ticket, number 113798. It was for the first-class cabin that the two shared, cabin B-86. Perhaps the Carters purchased a first-class cabin for their two most intimate servants because they were generous employers, but it's more likely that the purchase was made out of convenience, their servants would have dressed them several times a day, and it would have been rather bothersome for the Carters to have to wait for their helpers to make the trek from second class up to first class every time they were needed. 
I'm also of the mind that the valet and ladies mate got their first class tickets out of convenience more so than generosity, since their chauffeur, Augustus, was booked in second class, and he would not have been needed until the ship reached its final destination. That's three first class cabins, one second class cabin, boarding for two dogs, and the shipping of his new automobile. Mr. Carter likely paid at least $7,500 for that trip. Adjusted for inflation, that's over $240,000 today in 2024. So, here's what we know about their voyage. Titanic left Southampton on April 10th, shortly after noon, to start her maiden voyage. Everyone on board was looking forward to the trip of a lifetime. Well, everyone minus a few skeptical and religious passengers who had an issue with the Titanic being billed as an unsinkable ship. A number of people felt that calling it unsinkable was a way of saying that man was better than God, that the science of men could compete against the forces of God and win. But with the exception of those people, the general atmosphere was one of merriment and excitement. Upon entering the Ship of Dreams, the Carters and other first-class travelers found themselves in a large reception room. While those fortunate enough to hold first-class tickets were no strangers to luxury, Titanic's stunning features were like nothing that any of them had ever seen at sea. Everything about first-class on the Titanic made a statement, and the statement was that Titanic's first-class was superior to all other first-class travel. From the reception room, the Carters would have been escorted to their cabins and spent a little time resting and freshening up before dinner service. Meanwhile, Titanic was sailing along to Cherbourg, France to pick up the rest of its passengers for the transatlantic trip. And at 6.35 p.m., those passengers boarded from the French port. Among them were the unsinkable Molly Brown and Titanic's richest passenger, John Jacob Astor, and his new wife, the very young and very pregnant Madeline Astor. After dinner and a good night of rest on the 10th, it's safe to say that for the next three days on the ship, the Carter family and their fellow first-class travelers spent their hours doing a mix of these activities. For the ladies, one of the most time-consuming activities would have been changing clothes. A well-to-do woman would have dressed five times in a 24-hour cycle. Lucille Carter would wake up every morning and always, with the assistance of her lady's maid, Augusta, bathe, have her hair styled, and then change into her breakfast dress. William Carter would have had help from his manservant or valet, and I'm going to refer to him as the valet for the remainder of this story. Every morning, his valet would dress him in his day suit, which was a smart-looking three-piece suit. In these outfits, the Carters and other first-class couples would have breakfast and get in a little socializing in the mornings. From there, the next official order of the day began with a bugle call that went out for lunch. I know that a lot of us who enjoy this side of history are fans of Downton Abbey, and we can think of a bugle call as the same concept of the dressing gong that would sound letting the servants and members of the family know that it was time to dress before a meal. I see when I'm reading the comments that you all often suggest period dramas for me to watch. What are some of your favorites? Tell me in the comments section. I really enjoy The Tudors, Downton Abbey, and The Gilded Age, just to name a few. Back to lunch on the Titanic, though. First class passengers had a few options on where they could have their meals. The spacious dining saloon was one of them. Then there was the Café Parisian and the A la carte restaurant. Those two restaurants served the same menu, but if the passengers wanted a different atmosphere, they could switch up where they ate. If they wanted to feel like they were in Paris, they needed the Parisian. It was designed as a replica of a Parisian sidewalk café. It was decorated in trellis work, which gave it an open, airy feeling. The a la carte restaurant was decorated in Louis XVI style. It was carpeted with crystal lighting and had a really intimate feel. Most of the tables there were set for only two. It was referred to as the Ritz, an appreciation for the fact that it reminded the passengers of dining at the Ritz hotels, 
which was the ultimate mark of luxury at the time. And I think that it's great to have choices like that when you're on a ship because it can start to feel like the same day over and over when you're stuck on a vessel. Passengers could have had lunch or any meal at the a la carte restaurant or the Parisian cafe, but it would cost an extra fee as those two restaurants were not included in the price of their tickets. In addition to the upgraded decor in those two restaurants, another perk was that they were both open continuously from 8 a.m. until 11 p.m., unlike the large dining saloon that was included in the price of their tickets, which closed for hours after each service. And there's no doubt that William Carter could have paid the extra money for his family to dine at either the Parisian or the a la carte restaurants. But it's not like the dining saloon on the Titanic was a shabby place to dine. It was a much larger space with seating for 554 people, decorated in wooden paneling that was painted white. The floors were covered in blue linoleum tiles that featured an elaborate yellow and red pattern. The portholes on the dining saloon were covered in a way that gave the passengers the illusion that they were dining at a restaurant on shore rather than at sea. When the ship's bugler, Percy Fletcher, played the roast beef of Old England at 1 o'clock p.m., Lucille Carter and the other first-class ladies would be seated shortly after, wearing their fine day dresses. Only a couple of hours after lunch, the ladies of first class would have to change clothes yet again, this time for tea service, and of course that meant changing into their tea dresses. Yes, there were dresses made for drinking tea because your husband had a lot of money and you needed to spend it on something. Afternoon tea was from 3 to 5 p.m. It could be enjoyed in all of the dining spaces that I already mentioned as well as the reception room. Those who had tea there would get the extra bonus of live music because the orchestra played in the reception room for afternoon tea. And the tea service was mostly about the women. Those participating could have finger sandwiches, soups, samosas, and of course, tea. But one of the main things on the menu for tea service was gossip. This was a time for ladies in first class to talk about how many wealthy men were spending their money on mistresses. I can imagine Lucille Carter cutting her eyes at Benjamin Guggenheim's mistress who he had been flaunting in front of everyone for those few days. It's not lost on me that in modern times, a lot of people call gossip tea, and those two things went hand in hand in 1912. I'm sure that afternoon tea was entertaining for all of the ladies, especially the ones who weren't the subjects of the whispers and rumors. But the dinner service was the real show on the Titanic in first class. The bugle call went out an hour and a half before service. Starting at 6, there were pre-dinner drinks and another opportunity for conversation. Every night was a fashion show. The men would show up decked out in their finest white tie, and for the ladies who had been dressing fashionably all day, they saved their best for last. For dinner, they wore gowns, jewels, and sometimes even tiaras. If your husband was truly rich, this was your time to show it off. And this, fashion, was an area where Lucille Carter had sparkled her whole life. Her outfits and magnificent figure had been written about in society pages for years before she boarded the Titanic, and William Carter would have been proud to show her off. Years after getting married and having two children, she was still talked about for her remarkable beauty, stunning figure, and phenomenal sense of fashion. The first course was served at 7 o'clock, and for first-class passengers, dinner was no less than 10 courses. It could be from 10 to 13 courses depending on the night. So it's not surprising that the last meal of the day ran until after 11 p.m. Then after eating roughly a dozen courses of delicious cuisine, the ladies, like Lucille Carter, would stay at their tables and chat some more before retiring to bed. They'd have their final clothing change of the day as their ladies' maids helped them change into their sleeping gowns. The gentlemen would leave their dinner tables and proceed to the smoking room. This was the only room on the Titanic that had a real 
working fireplace. There were a number of fake fireplaces in some of the shared amenity spaces and some first-class cabins, but they were just there for the sake of appearance. In the smoking room, the first-class gentlemen ended their nights with brandy, cigars, conversations, cards, and gambling. There's a reason why women didn't go in there with them. Some of the ladies would have been raising hell if they could have witnessed their husbands gambling away their fortunes. This whole meal itinerary, plus making use of amenities like the Titanic's gymnasium, squash court, lounge, library, reading and writing room, and spacious promenade deck for walking or playing shuffleboard, chess, or dominoes would have given the first-class men and women a full day of activities. And if they wanted to partake in a little extra self-care, they could also have taken advantage of the ship's Turkish bath, steam room, or private massage room for an extra fee of $1, about $32 in today's money. And we know that William Carter would not have had any problem paying that fee. Now, those were the typical days on the Titanic. But now, we need to get into April 14th, the final day on the Ship of Dreams. That was an atypical day in more ways than one. On that morning, the dining saloon served a different purpose. In addition to serving food, it doubled as a place of worship. You see, the 14th was a Sunday, so first-class passengers were given an Anglican church service, officiated by the ship's captain, Edward J. Smith. The service started sometime around 10.30 or 11 a.m., depending on which source you read. And don't worry, second- and third-class passengers were allowed to attend church services, too, just not in first class. There were clergymen traveling in second and third class who led services for those passengers, Father Thomas Biles and Father Peruschitz. As a matter of fact, in third class, there had been a daily Catholic mass which was attended by a number of the passengers, as there were many Catholics in second and third classes. Father Thomas Biles spoke English, Irish, and French. He said mass for both second and third class on the morning of the last day at sea, and Father Pershowitz had given Mass every day for second- and third-class travelers in German and Hungarian. After worship services, activities on the ship went back to business as usual. Then, at dinner time in the a la carte restaurant, a few select members of the first-class passengers were treated to a special dinner. William and Lucille Carter were in that number. It was a dinner held in honor of Captain Smith and it was hosted by the Wideners, George and Eleanor. George Widener was an extremely wealthy streetcar magnate who was on the Titanic, returning home to Pennsylvania. He had been in Paris looking for a new chef for the new hotel that he owned, the Ritz-Carlton in Philadelphia. In addition to the Carters, Mr. and Mrs. John B. Thayer, Major Archibald Butt, and the Whitener's eldest son, Harry, joined the table for the captain's dinner. As we know, dinner on the Titanic was quite the affair and was known to last past 11 p.m. The night of the 14th was no exception. After their meal, the gentlemen excused themselves from the table and left to go to the smoking room. Lucille Carter and the other ladies would have sat at the table and likely had a conversation on where they would meet for breakfast or tea the next day on the ship but there wouldn't be a next day on the ship. After finishing their talk at the dinner table, the ladies made their way up that grand staircase, back to their cabins to have their ladies' maids change them for the last time of the day, and then retire to bed and off to their sweet dreams. But on the night of the 14th, those dreams would be cut short, and everyone on that ship who was asleep would wake up to a real life nightmare. So let's get into what happened to the Carter family, William and William, Lucille and Lucille, during the sinking of the Titanic. Mrs. Lucille was tucked into her bed and asleep when the Titanic struck the iceberg at 11.40 p.m. Shortly after the impact, she was awakened by her husband who quickly escorted his wife and their two children to lifeboat number four. And just so you know, I'm giving you this story straight from Lucille's own words as she told her account 
to the Baltimore Sun newspaper on Friday, April 19, 1912, just days after the disaster. So, from this point, I'm reading her words, or the words of the news writer, until I tell you that we're back to my words. As I'm reading it to you, know that it's not completely in the order that the story was written, but I'm presenting those original words to you in a manner that's pretty close to the chronological order of events. I'm sure that we can imagine that Lucille's nerves would have been frazzled at the time that she spoke to the press, and so her thoughts were probably skipping all over the place, and so was her story. And also because of that, neither will I tell you this complete story, because Lucille also spoke about other passengers that don't have anything to do with the essence of our story today. People like John Jacob Astor, his wife Madeline, and other first-class passengers and crew members. I have published a number of Titanic passenger scandals on this channel, and generally, from the time that the ship struck the iceberg until the passengers were rescued by the Carpathia, the details that I share in my videos are based on the timeline that was figured out by the general consensus at the two inquiries into the Titanic disaster, one held in New York City and the other in London. But I'm going to abandon most of that for this video as we get into this first-hand account from Lucille Carter. Even if her timeline isn't perfect, Having her story gives us a really unique opportunity to hear the recollection of a survivor. In my opinion, it kind of takes us back to that moment as if we are reading the newspaper on April the 19th, 1912, and wondering exactly what we're going to learn. Just know that before this story wraps up, you'll understand another reason why Lucille's memory of the events might have been really scattered and not so correct when she talked to the press. So... I'm now quoting excerpts from, but out of sequence, this story from the Baltimore Sun called Women Pull Oars. Mrs. William E. Carter tells a terrible experience after wreck. Quote, We had a pleasant voyage from England. The ship behaved splendidly, and we did not anticipate any trouble at all. I had retired on Sunday night an hour before we struck the iceberg. The men were in the cabin smoking. Most of them were in the smoking room when the ship hit. The first I knew of the accident was a tremendous thump which nearly threw me out of my berth. I realized that something must have happened and feared that it was a bad accident. A moment later, my husband came down to the stateroom and told me that we had struck an iceberg. There was no confusion. I dressed myself hurriedly and went out on deck with my children. The ship was badly damaged. The officers thought at first that she would not sink, and we were told to be calm. But it was not too long before we knew that the ship would not long stand the strain of the water, which was pouring into the bow and bearing the ship down in her forward part. Then came the time that we knew that it must either be the lifeboats or stay on the ship and sink with her. The seamen began to lower away the lifeboats. One after another, they released whatever machinery held them, and they dropped into the ocean. There was ice all about us, and the night being comparatively clear, we could see the flows all around us when we peered down over the side of the ship. When the boats had been lowered, then it was that time of parting came. There was no excitement. Every one of the men whose wives or women folk were with them took them to the side of the ship, where a lifeboat was waiting, and kissed them before they took them over the side. I kissed my husband goodbye, and as he stood on the deck, I went down the side to a lifeboat. There were no seamen there. It was life or death. I took an oar and started to row. Mrs. Astor was in my boat. The colonel took her to the side and kissed her and saw her over. Then she came into our boat. When I went over the side with my children and got in the boat, there were no seamen in it. Then came a few men but there were oars, with no one to use them. The boat had been filled with passengers, and there was nothing else for me to do but to take an oar. We could now see that the time of the ship had come. She was sinking quickly, and we were warned by cries from the men above to pull away from the ship quickly. Mrs. Thayer, wife of the vice president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, was in my boat, and she, too, took an oar. 
It was cold and we had not time to clothe ourselves with warm overcoats. The rowing warmed me. We started to pull away from the ship. We could see the dim outlines of the decks above, but we could not recognize anybody. We had pulled our lifeboat away from the Titanic for a distance of about a city block. That is about all, I should say, when the Titanic seemed to shake to pieces. The ship had struck about 14 minutes to 12. It was just 10 minutes past when I saw her lunge. She had exploded. There was a rumbling noise within her. Then she gave a lurch and started to go down. We realized what it meant. That the sinking ship would suck us under with her. It was a moment later that the suction struck us. It was all we could do to keep from being sucked down. So strong was the drag that followed the Titanic. After ten minutes past one o'clock, there was a sudden explosion and the giant hulk of the ship blew up, rearing up in the water like a spurred horse and then sinking beneath the waves. But we pulled away at last after straining as hard as we could at the oars. Then we were alone in the boat and it seemed darker. We remained in the boat all night, waiting for daylight to come. It came at last, and when it broke over the sea, we saw ice flows all about us. It was about 8.30 o'clock when the Carpathia came into sight. I can't tell how I felt when I saw her. I had believed that my husband had gone down on the ship. It wasn't until after we were taken over the side of the Carpathia that I saw him. Mr. Carter had been compelled to take an oar in a lifeboat that was not sufficiently manned. That is how he came to be saved. All of the men waited for the women to go first. Mr. Carter was among this number. When he put me into a lifeboat, he stayed back. And I thought that when I saw the ship blow up and sink, that he had gone down with her. But Mr. Carter had the same experience as did Mr. Ismay. Now this is the reporter asking, did you experience any discomfort while you were in the boat? And Lucille replies, No, no other than usual. Now the reporter writes, Mrs. Carter was not inclined to talk at all. It was only after repeated questions that she gave the details, speaking in brief sentences which betrayed her nervousness. Mr. Carter would not talk of the disaster at all, and Mrs. Carter said that she did not wish him to be disturbed. Now it's back to Lucille. I can't say anything other than that the men aboard the ship behaved so bravely that no one can make any criticism. I don't think that there should be any investigation of the disaster. I don't think it deserves any. It was an accident, pure and simple. Officers of the ship could not see the iceberg, and we struck it so hard that the boat could not withstand the shock. Now this is the reporter again. While Mrs. Carter is still suffering from the shock of the disaster, the agony of the few hours when she believed that her husband had plunged down with the Titanic, when the liner reared and pitched into the sea, and the stress of the days of returning to land, she is expected to recover in a few days. Mr. Carter was cheerful from the time that he stepped off the ship at the dock, and he met those who had come to greet his party with a quiet smile. He was frankly glad to be alive, but most of all that his family had escaped and that he had been reunited with them. End quote. Thank you for watching the story of this brave family. I'll see you on the next video. Just kidding. I know that you know me better than that. If this story were the whole truth, I wouldn't be telling it here because that would be so boring. Luckily for us, a lot of this story that Lucille told is a bunch of baloney. Now we're at the part where we rip someone to shreds. That is why this channel was called Hot Mess History. You see, I learned about this couple the same way that I learned about a lot of the people who were on Titanic. After seeing their names on a survivor's list, I just did a little digging into the Carters and I saw that they were divorced just two years after the sinking of the Titanic. So of course I thought, you see a family survive a disaster like this, then you think that they can make it through anything. So why did Lucille file for a divorce from William two years after they survived the sinking of the Titanic? 
we're about to get there. First, I want to share with you what the Baltimore Sun writer had to say about Lucille. He was blown away by the composure that she displayed while retelling the horrific events of that late night and early morning. Here's what he wrote, quote, Mrs. Carter probably did not realize that she was one of the first to give the exact manner in which the boat went down. When she told how the ship struck at 1146 o'clock Sunday night, how the women and children and the few men who manned the oars pulled away, how 20 minutes later at 110, the giant Titanic exploded with a roar and a crash and took all on board to the bottom. How the powerful suction of the sinking vessel drew the boat in which she, with Mrs. John B. Thayer, was pulling an oar with two men and forced them to pull for their lives to escape the maelstrom. When she spoke of how she, in common with the other women, kissed their husband goodbye and did not know until afterward that he had got into another boat. All through this recital, which would move the average woman to tears and blanch the cheeks of men, she was as cool as if she had been merely describing one of the ordinary daily events of her life." End quote. My, my, my! How could Lucille remain so calm, discussing all of those brave men, like her husband, who got their families safely secured away in lifeboats sending them off with kisses, and then going off to rescue even more women and children. It's almost as if she was detached from the story, like she was telling someone else's story. And poor William, he didn't have the heart to say anything at all. That would have been so odd for a woman, a lady, to have experienced every bit of horror that her husband did. But she was the one who was composed enough to talk to the press while he was shocked into silence? What kind of man is that? Remember this part from her story, quote, Mr. Carter would not talk of the disaster at all, and Mrs. Carter said that she did not wish him to be disturbed, end quote. Well, here's why she did all the talking. Because apparently he was a bad liar and wouldn't have been able to tell the press with a straight face just what a coward he was. We already know that this couple got divorced, so we're going to jump forward a few years to 1915 so that we can know why Lucille left William Carter, and yes, part of the reason. A big part of the reason has to do with what happened on the night the Titanic struck an iceberg. We'll get into other reasons later, but check out this headline from the Baltimore Sun dated January 21st, 1915 said Carter was cruel. Former Lucille Polk's divorce testimony partly revealed he left her aboard Titanic. Yes, so that whole story about how William came into their cabin, woke up Lucille to tell her that the ship hit an iceberg, then escorted her and the children to a lifeboat and gave her a kiss before being lowered off the ship into her lifeboat. That story was all a bunch of hooey. Balderdash. Malarkey. Pardon my language. Now let me tell you what really happened that night. The Carters attended a dinner at the a la carte restaurant held in honor of the ship's captain. True. After the dinner, Lucille went to her cabin to go to bed, and William went to the smoking room with the other gentlemen. True. The Titanic struck an iceberg at 11.40 p.m. Of course, true. William woke up Lucille, saying, Honey, get up, dear. The ship is about to go down, and I need to be sure that you and my children are safe. Let's get you to a lifeboat. Then he did just that, and kissed her goodbye, with an uncertainty of ever seeing her again. False. According to the story that William and Lucille made up for public consumption, John Jacob Astor George Widener and John Thayer were all with William Carter as he escorted his family to the lifeboat. It turns out that this original story that the Carters concocted was truly a convenient one. Seeing as all of the men William would have come in contact with were dead and could not bear witness to his account or deny it. Remember that when Lucille was recounting her story to the reporter, she said that she didn't want an investigation into the shipwreck 
It was all just an accident. Leave those men alone. They've suffered enough. Well, the truth was that William came running into his family's cabin and told his wife, and I quote, Get up and dress yourself and the children. End quote. From that point, he took off running like Bruce Jenner to get himself to safety, never once looking back for his wife or daughter or son. Basically, everything that I have told you about Lucille's story was true, only after the part when her lifeboat was lowered. Lucille did take an oar and helped row her lifeboat to safety. She was a hero that night and early morning. She did see John Jacob Astor put his wife, Madeline, into her lifeboat and give her a kiss and wish her farewell. She saw the same for every other married woman in her boat. So it seems that she just stole that part from their stories when she made up the lie, telling the newspaper that her own husband kissed her goodbye. She was covering for her husband, who did nothing to protect her or their children on that frightful early morning. But my oh my, in real life, I cannot imagine the thoughts that must have been going through Lucille's mind after she was hoisted up onto the rescue ship the Carpathia, still scrambling about, trying to make sense of what she had just experienced in the hours past, and then adjusting her eyes and focusing on what or whom she was actually seeing. Like, wait, I know that can't be William over there. Let me explain. I want you to hear it in her words, and here they are, taken from the court record of her divorce hearing. Quote, on April 10th, 1912, we sailed for America on the Titanic. When the Titanic struck, my husband came to our stateroom and said, Get up and dress yourself and the children. I never saw him again until I arrived at the Carpathia at 8 o'clock the next morning, when I saw him lying on the rail. All he said was that he had had a jolly good breakfast and that he never thought I would make it. End quote. Can you imagine? Lucille hadn't exactly made it in the clear just because she was on the Carpathia. She still had to maneuver for herself and her children to get everyone comfortable, get some warm clothes or at least blankets, and then some food too. Her son had been complaining about being hungry all morning long, and it just so happened that while she was walking on one of the decks that she runs into her husband, William, after he'd had a jolly good breakfast. There was no, Oh my, thank God you were alive. I was worried about you and the children all morning long. No, instead she was met with, Oh, you're alive. This guy, sitting in the Carpathia dining room having breakfast that morning, dripping tears into his coffee as he cried to other passengers. She's dead. <laughs> dead, I tell you. My sweet, sweet Linda. I mean Lucille. Will you please pass me the syrup? Is that real maple? Oh, it's heavenly. Oh, no, I just remembered my, my kids, too. Somehow I will go on. Waiter, will you please bring me some more French toast? And make sure it has a little confectioner's sugar on it. Thank you so much. And after all of that, Lucille is fumbling around, just trying to find a biscuit to throw in her son's mouth so that he'll shut up about being hungry and she can just have a moment of silence to take a deep breath and figure out the rest of her life. At this point, she's thinking that her husband is dead. Then, who does she see? Leaning over the rail? Wiping crumbs off of his mouth and rubbing his stuffed belly? William! Hello, honey. I thought that you were dead. I just had a jolly good breakfast, though. You had a jolly good what? Why, I ought to give you a jolly good lump upside your head. But seriously, he didn't even think to ask her about their children when he saw her. It's just insane to me that he left behind his entire family. It would have been one thing if he and his wife had been having troubles 
and maybe he didn't care for her as much as he once had, and that would have been bad enough if he had left her behind but still grabbed the children. But to not even think to save his 14-year-old daughter and or his 12-year-old son, just one of the kids, in my opinion, is unforgivable. I know sometimes that people say that I'm harsh and judgmental when I tell these stories, so you tell me what you think about that. I'm going to share with you a few more facts about the Carter's Titanic journey. Then I'll tell you a little bit more about the issues that were brought up in their divorce. For now, I'll just say, I don't know how they even made it to the Titanic together. This first bit is just for people who enjoy Titanic lore in general. You may know that there were stories printed saying that Captain Smith shot himself. That was one of the many rumors printed in order to sell more newspapers. Well, according to Lucille, when her lifeboat was about a block away from the Titanic, she saw the captain jump overboard, laying to rest the rumor that he ended his own life by shooting. You take that and do with it what you will. I'm just sharing what she said. We also know that news stories about the survivors were often full of misinformation. There were so many headlines stating that people survived who had actually died and vice versa. So it's no surprise that Lucille's family could only make guesses about her safety until they heard from her directly. I have a couple of quotes, one from her father on April 16th and one from her brother on April 19th. They are probably going to sound like rich people being callous and disregarding anyone who didn't have enough money for a first-class ticket. Quote, Mr. Polk, father of Mrs. Carter, said that if the passengers who were rescued from the Titanic before she went down were first-class passengers, and they presume that they were, they are reasonably sure of the safety of their daughter. End quote. That might seem cold, but that's typically how it went priority was given to first-class passengers, even when it came down to the matter of life and death. Then there was Lucille's brother, Anderson, who was concerned about the property of William and Lucille. After learning that his sister, brother-in-law, niece, and nephew had all survived because he went to New York to meet them when their rescue ship arrived, part of his statement for the Baltimore Sun was, quote, She and my brother-in-law lost everything they owned, including all their jewelry. End quote. Yes, they lost all of their belongings that they brought on the Titanic, including that fancy brand new Raynault automobile. But you might also remember that the Carters boarded the Titanic with a few servants and two dogs. And with the exception of Lucille's lady's maid, Augusta, all of the other living, breathing souls that they were bringing home to the States died. I do find it odd that her brother didn't mention any of them, only their stuff. William's valet, Alexander, died. He preceded his parents in debt. They were able to receive money from the Titanic Relief Fund, and we can look at that almost like a life insurance policy payout. Their chauffeur, Augustus, died as well. He was married with a child. He and his wife, Eleanor, would have celebrated their fifth wedding anniversary on March 12th, just a month before Titanic's maiden voyage. Their daughter, Alice, was four years old when her father passed away. Their bodies were never recovered, or if they were, they were never claimed by their families. One interesting tidbit about the chauffeur Augustus, is that he left all of his money to a man named Walter Farrow. This man was a toolmaker with a wife and family of his own. I don't know what kind of relationship these two fellows had, but I do find it strange that his estate didn't go to his own wife and child. And yes, whatever you right now are thinking is a possibility about that relationship, I am also thinking. Anyway... There were a total of 12 dogs that traveled on the Titanic. Only three survived, and neither of the Carter's dogs were in that number. For those of you who don't know, I am a huge animal lover, so it was all the more off-putting to read the comment from Lucille's brother, stating that they had lost everything they owned, 
including their jewelry. Not to mention that that wasn't even true. Lucille and William lost all of their material possessions that were on the ship, but they still had three mansions that were fully furnished, like give me a break. The day after Lucille's account was printed in the Baltimore Sun, April 20th, 1912, the paper printed Lucille's mother's thoughts about her daughter and her son-in-law. She was in awe of their heroism. And there's no wonder why. Of course, Lucille had to tell everyone how brave her husband had been that night. No less would have been expected of William as a gentleman. So, everyone believed her story. Here's what was printed about Lucille's mother. Quote, Though proud of her daughter, Mrs. Polk was no less proud of her son-in-law. She was glad that he was saved, but far more proud of the undisputed fact that he, with Colonel Astor and the other heroes, parted from his wife with no hope of seeing her and the two children again. End quote. Well, part of that was true. William did part from his wife with no hope of seeing her again. But the undisputed fact that he was a hero was a big, fat lie. Male chivalry was a much bigger deal in those days than it is now, and among the high society men, even more so. There was a code. All of those millionaires didn't die on the Titanic because they wanted to. They had a duty to protect the women and children, and they didn't take it lightly. In a situation where any woman or child wouldn't have had a chance to survive, it would have been expected of those men to die. That was the honorable thing to do. Trust that being a male survivor of the Titanic was not an easy task. And the men who did survive received a lot of vitriol. Even with this fake hero narrative that had been whipped up for William Carter, he still had to defend his actions. And we can only imagine how irritated and embarrassed Lucille must have been for getting praise right alongside her husband, when in fact she was the only real hero that night between the two of them. He hadn't done anything but abandoned his family in order to fend for himself, but still, some of the people who heard his story were ready to give him a medal of honor. Here's a direct quote from Lucille's mother. My daughter says that she was in the same boat with Mrs. Astor and Mrs. Thayer, and that her husband kissed her goodbye as the other husbands had, and stood back for the boat to be lowered, Mrs. Polk said with pride, end quote. Well, your daughter lied, Mrs. Polk. And it seems that holding in that lie is eventually what led Lucille to filing for a divorce from William. Now we're going to get into the divorce record. And what we're going to see is that Lucille had a habit of not telling people just how awful William was. It seems like his cowardice displayed on the night of the Titanic disaster was just the straw that broke the camel's back. And then she finally exploded. When she opened the can of worms, she was just ready to let it all out and finally be done with him. But had Lucille really been holding in her true feelings about her husband? Well, you know the saying, you can fool some people sometimes, but you can't fool all the people all the time. Sure, she put up a good facade regarding their marriage, but when the rumors started swirling about the pending divorce, her closest society friends were not surprised. William told the press that even he was caught off guard by Lucille filing for divorce against him, and there's just no way that that's true. How do we know that? Looky here. On January 31st, 1914, the Baltimore Sun ran this story. Carter suit expected. Friends of society leaders here knew of discontent. And it has everything in it that you would expect it to have. It basically says that their friends knew that the couple seemed distant and not so friendly to each other, but especially after their Titanic trip. It also tells of one society function in which Lucille lost it and, quote, had society almost clinging to ropes. Now, this happened shortly before the Titanic trip. Lucille and William were at a horse show, and in a rather loud voice, Lucille said that she would rather leave than have a wet dish rag for her husband. Then what happened? 
They went on the Titanic, and William didn't even try to save her. There had definitely been trouble brewing in paradise. But this news didn't come to light until 1914. However, the Carters' relationship was still looking shabby to the people who didn't know about this wet dish rag comment at the horse show. So William tried to make people believe that he had no idea of why his wife would want to divorce him. But all of their friends saw all of this stuff going on. Right, William. Yeah, you don't know why she wants a divorce. You see, only a couple of months after the shipwreck, William got into a horrible accident while he was doing what he loved to do most, taking care of his family. Just kidding, he was playing polo. On June 8, 1912, the Daily News reported that William was thrown off of his pony, then the pony landed on top of him. Maybe the pony knew that William was okay with letting his family drown on the Titanic, but I don't want to speculate too much about the pony's actions and motives. William sustained some severe injuries, including to his brain. People thought that he was going to die. He lived, but he was never able to play polo again. And you can be sure that his recovery process was a long road, which would have made people wonder why the very next month, his wife was out at another society event and not at home, taking care of her critically injured husband. Here's what the Evening Sun printed about Lucille that July. Quote, Mrs. William E. Carter of Philadelphia, formerly Miss Lucille Polk of Baltimore, is visiting Mrs. J. Gordon Douglas at her villa at Newport. Mr. Carter is recovering at their country place at Bryn Mawr, near Philadelphia, from the effects of a recent accident in playing polo. End quote. Yeah. It doesn't seem like Lucille was really worried about William's little old brain injury. She left the city, left the state, to go have some fun with her friends. You see what I mean? People around them had to have clues that this marriage was in trouble. Can you imagine Lucille's friends talking to her when she got to Newport? Lucille, I'm so glad that you made it here, but I'm surprised. We thought that you would be at home nursing William. How is he doing? We heard about his polo accident. Mm, I'm not sure. He's probably dying. Are those new gloves? They are beautiful. <laughs> Look, how could we expect her to care after what he did to her on that ship, right? Leaving his family behind on the Titanic was certainly bad enough. But here's what Lucille had to say about that rascal of a husband of hers after years of pretending to the public that he had been a perfect gentleman and a wonderful husband and father. These are Lucille's complaints about William from their divorce record, and he disputed none of these. And just for fun, you tell me which one you think is the worst. There are 10. Here we go. Number one. There was an occasion when William was torturing a grasshopper in front of Lucille in an effort to disgust and shock her. He pulled off the grasshopper's legs one by one. Lucille cried out for him to stop. When he finally did, he grabbed his horsewhip and horsewhipped Lucille as a punishment for telling him what to do. Number two. He frequently boxed her ears, as in punched her in the ears without provocation. Number three, he was nearly always drunk. Number four, William once kicked Lucille in her back. My goodness. Number five, on one occasion when the family was living in England, he stayed in bed for two months straight drinking whiskey every day until he was in a maudlin condition or overly emotional state. Now, this one is a double whammy because he did it in England. We know that over there they think that emotions are vulgar. What was he thinking? How American? Hey, I'm just kidding. We love our English historians. It's just a joke <laughs> and an observation. Number six, he went with other women. That means he had multiple affairs. Ladies, take this as a warning that looks don't mean everything. You can be the most gorgeous woman within a 50-mile radius and still have a man cheat on you. 
And I'm only bringing that up because when it was announced that she was divorcing him, the papers were still talking about how incredibly attractive Lucille was. One headline even read, Perfect Blonde Sues for Divorce. And not one of my multiple sources for this video described William as anything fascinating to see. You've seen him. Number seven. William had a habit of calling Lucille vile and disgusting names. Number eight. When the couple were on holiday in Monte Carlo, Lucille was sick when they arrived, so she went straight to her hotel room to rest. While she lay sick in bed, William stayed out all night. He returned the next morning, intoxicated. When Lucille took issue with his behavior and asked him why he didn't take care of her, he said, and this is a quote from the record, I didn't come here to be your maid. I came here to see some of the most attractive women in the world. End quote. Well, I guess that's just one more reason why she didn't give a darn about taking care of him after his polo injury after the Titanic sank. Number nine, he was continually on the move and seldom stayed in one place more than one month at a time. In my opinion, this is the least severe complaint on this list, though I admit that I don't fully understand the context. I'm thinking that was a complaint because it would have complicated schooling for their children, as in perhaps they had to keep taking them out of and enrolling them into new schools whenever William wanted to move. I'm just not certain. Tell me what you think. I could be overlooking something more serious. And number 10. This one actually seems like it could be an extension of number 9, like a 9B. When the family was on their stints living in Philadelphia, William often absented himself for a month at a time, telling Lucille he was going on a hunting trip or to play a polo match, which would mean that he would return later that day or possibly be gone for a few days at most. Well, instead of leaving for his polo match, he would go to England. Yeah, not right around the corner from Philadelphia. But there were other times that he was at least honest with Lucille and bold enough to tell her that he was leaving and going away to Germany for weeks or months at a time to have drinks, leaving her alone with their children. She said that this happened a lot in 1907 and 1908, so he was leaving her at home alone when their children were very young. Sure, she would have had a staff of servants, but I can only guess that those must have been difficult times for Lucille, especially knowing that her husband was a cheating alcoholic. There's no telling what kinds of thoughts were running through her mind about what her husband was out doing. Well, that's our list of complaints. It's pretty short. Why would she ever want to leave such a great guy? <laughs> of course, I'm kidding. He deserved a punch in the nose, at the very least, for all of the emotional and physical abuse he put her through. Well, William was soon going to learn that even though he didn't appreciate his wife, other men would. And at least one other one truly did. And William was also going to learn that for him... Being a man who was a known coward who had left his family to die on the Titanic, that would make it pretty hard for him to attract the hot babes he wanted. Because women generally liked guys who wouldn't leave them behind to die in an emergency situation. Needless to say, Lucille Carter got her divorce, and only months later, in August of 1914, the beautiful blonde was married to... Yet another rich gentleman, George Seabrook, also of Philadelphia. Like her ex-husband, George was a millionaire society man. His money came from the banking and steel manufacturing industries. George was a friend of another man who had been a friend to both William and Lucille, and this friend of the Carters introduced Lucille to the new guy. George and Lucille had planned on getting married at the end of 1915, but the start of World War I hastened their plans, in case you're wondering why she didn't give it more time after her divorce before she got married again. After all, she had been married to William for 17 years. But time waits for no man, and neither does a good woman. Lucille and George got married in London, then traveled back to the United States to set up their marital home in Pennsylvania, and they sailed back on the Olympic. 
one of Titanic's sister ships. I will always be amazed at how anyone who lived through the Titanic tragedy could find the nerve to ever get on a ship again, but to top it off, to get back on a white star line vessel. Shortly after the Carters divorced and Lucille remarried, their daughter Lucille was coming of age. Remember, she was 14 when they were on the Titanic. Now she was 18, and it was time for her to have her own debutante balls, like her mother had done years before. With William and Lucille not having the most amicable split, they each hosted separate galas for their daughter. So, the young Lucille was doing double time in her debut season, compared to her affluent peers. Speaking of their children, in case you have any doubts about the story of William leaving his wife and children to possibly die on the Titanic, the son of William and Lucille, William Carter II, confirmed the account that his mother gave in her divorce proceedings. Of course, William denied that he left his family behind, but William II's story tells a different tale. In his own words that were chronicled in Titanic Children, Eyewitnesses to History, he said, quote, Mama awakened me just after the collision. She came to me just as I opened my eyes and told me that there had been an accident. She told me to be a brave boy and to dress myself as quickly as I could. While she and my sister Lucille were dressing, I dressed myself, and then we all went up on the deck where we had been told to go. Up there, we found the women all crowded around one part, while over on the other side were men all kept back by men with revolvers. All of the children were with the women, and while the people were getting into the boats, a man would try to break through the line, and then there would be some shooting. Once a lot of the men got through and there was some shooting, and several of the men fell on the deck while everyone cried out very loudly. One of the men stood still for some time, and all of his jaw was shot away. I was watching him, clinging to my mother's skirt, when it came our turn to get into the boat. It was hard in the boat, and we found there was very little to eat in it. Then everyone was worried about whether we would be picked up or not. Some were very brave, but cried a lot. We rowed away from the big ship, and then in the daylight, we saw the Carpathia coming and we were picked up. I am awfully glad my mama and my sister Lucille were saved, and I feel very sorry too for those who've lost their lives. It was awful sad. End quote. You can see that he wasn't bad mouthing his father. He was merely recalling the events of that night and morning, and his father was simply not in the picture. So it shouldn't be a surprise to learn that William Carter, the father and ex husband, spent the rest of his life in a rather lonely state. Two years after Lucille remarried, William was back in the news because he was being sued for defamation. While at a dinner dance, he called a man a thief and a liar. Well, we know William liked to drink. Maybe he had a little too much to drink at that party, too. For the next few years after his divorce, he was the defendant in a number of lawsuits. My favorite one was in November of 1916, when William was sued for $811 for lingerie that Lucille had ordered. She ordered it in Paris in 1913, when she was still his wife. She had received the lingerie, but William had never paid the bill. In our money today, the cost for that lingerie was $23,000. He could afford to pay for it easily. He was still a millionaire. But I did chuckle a little, thinking about William having to pay for lingerie that he would never get to see Lucille wear, and her second husband having that benefit. William lived the rest of his life in disgrace, much like J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line who went down in infamy for getting into a lifeboat and saving himself during the Titanic mayhem. That scene was so brilliantly portrayed in James Cameron's Titanic, and it turns out that William Carter spent a good amount of time publicly defending Bruce Ismay after the disaster. Some reports say that the two of them were rescued together. Other sources say that William was on the first lifeboat that was lowered. From the day that William's divorce was made public until the day that he died, 
almost every news article about him described him as a coward on the night of the Titanic sinking. Even if it was just a story about him attending a party. If it wasn't his Titanic cowardice, the other detail that papers kept printing about him was that Lucille was his wife, even though he had had a very public divorce. And that's just so disrespectful to Lucille and her second husband, George. William Carter went to visit Palm Beach, Florida in the winter of 1940, as he had done in previous years. But that year, he fell sick and was hospitalized, eventually dying at the age of 64. And even then, a number of the newspapers were still calling Lucille his wife. Lucille and her second husband, George Brooke, went on to have a seemingly happy and relatively quiet life. They had one daughter together in 1916. Her name was Elizabeth. Lucille and George remained married until she passed away in the home that they shared, called Almondberry House. She died of heart disease at the age of 58 in 1934, only months after Elizabeth, the daughter she had with George, made her society debut. Just for the sake of trivia, their daughter Elizabeth lived to be 100 years old. And yes, even in Lucille's death announcement, it was mentioned that she was the great, great grandniece of President Polk. As for the daughter Lucille, she got married in 1922 when she was 25 years old. Her husband was Samuel Reeves. He was a millionaire too, the president of the Phoenix Iron Company in Pennsylvania. Like many Titanic survivors, Lucille never talked about the horrors of that night for the rest of her life. But any fears that she might have had after that frightening experience didn't stop her from making numerous transatlantic trips throughout the rest of her life. Luxury travel was just a part of her lifestyle. Lucille and her husband made their family home in Ratnor, Delaware, and had three children. They remained married until he died. Lucille never remarried, and in 1962, she died of heart failure at the age of 65. And the son, William II, went on to do quite well for himself in banking. He married twice. The first time was in 1925 to a society girl from his Bryn Mawr neighborhood. Her name was Sintra Ellis. The couple had a daughter in 1930 who was named Sintra after her mother. And I have to say that one thing that I enjoy about covering this era is seeing so many girls named after their mothers, not just boys named after their fathers. One of the articles I used even referred to the daughter Lucille as Lucille Jr. Anyway, William II and his first wife divorced in April of 1943. I was only able to figure that out after I found their daughter's wedding announcement from 1950 showing her mother named as Mrs. Howard C. Fair. So clearly, she had a new husband by the time that their daughter got married. So I had to do a little backtracking. A few months after he divorced Sintra, William married a woman named Ella Snelling, and I was able to find in a society page from February of 1944 that William and his new wife were being entertained by the George D. Wideners, Remember Lucille and William Carter were sitting in a dinner hosted by George D. Widener and his wife on the night that the Titanic sank? And here, in 1944, George Widener, named after his father, was hosting William Carter, who was named after his father. They keep those circles tight, don't they? Well, aside from young William's account of the Titanic tragedy that I shared with you earlier, he never spoke of it again. And he also traveled extensively throughout his life, but on French ships and the Aquitania and Mauritania, which were Cunard liners. Cunard owned Titanic's rescue vessel, the Carpathia. And it makes perfect sense to me to trust the company that rescued you at sea. I'm surprised that more Titanic survivors didn't take his approach to travel at sea. William was also an avid animal lover and it was said that the loss of his dogs on the Titanic is something that he never got over, and I can 100% relate. Perhaps his years of service on the board of the Philadelphia Zoological Society allowed him to support animals and, at the same time, helped him to cope with the loss of his pets. 
he remained married to his second wife until she died in 1984. He died only months later in January of 1985 at the age of 84. And that puts the entire Carter family to rest. William's fancy foreign car, the Renault, was being shipped in a crate located in the cargo hold in the forward section of the ship, a part of Titanic which still remains relatively intact. So there is a possibility that the flashy car could still be in one piece at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Perhaps one day we'll find out if multimillionaires keep taking dives down there to view the wreckage. But maybe we'll never know. One thing that we know that was shattered to pieces was the reputation of William Carter. It went right down along with the Titanic and his 1912 Renault. While none of the Carter family members were victims of the Titanic disaster in that they survived, Lucille, the daughter Lucille, and William II were the victims of a selfish and cowardly husband and father. We're all smart here, so the moral of this story practically goes without saying. Gentlemen, when disaster strikes, save your wife and children, or at least, if you don't, don't lie about it and pretend that you did. Now, William wasn't as brave as he was portrayed in the newspapers after the Titanic sank, but Lucille was. She did row that lifeboat that contained, among other passengers, Madeline Astor, the young wife of the richest man on the Titanic, John Jacob Astor. He died on the early morning of April 15, 1912, and he left his wife financially set for life, as long as she never remarried. But Madeline Astor did remarry, twice. Her second marriage made sense, but her third one did not. At all. She was a middle-aged fool for love, and he was a young, good-looking boxer and their marriage was a total hot mess. I published a video about it that you can see here. I will also leave links to it in the description box and the pinned comment. Only a couple of hours after lunch, the ladies of first class would have to change clothes yet again, this time for tea service. And of course that meant changing into their tea dresses. Charlie, hush. I am, I am recording. Hush. My sources for this story are The Baltimore Sun Archives, 1894, 1912, 1914, and 1916. The Philadelphia Inquirer Archives, 1896, 1925, 1934, 1944, 1946, 1950, and 1985. The Evening Journal Archives, 1896. The Evening Sun Archives, 1911, 1912, 1914, and 1916. The Frederick Post Archives, 1912. The Daily News Archives, 1912. The Democratic Messenger Archives, 1912. The Shreveport Journal Archives, 1914. Fall River Daily Evening News Archives, 1914. The Boston Globe Archives, 1915. The Washington Post Archives, 1915. Daily Local News Archives, 1915. The Kansas City Post Archives, 1915. Pittsburgh Post-Gazette Archives, 1915. The Cincinnati Inquirer Archives, 1915. Carbondale Daily News Archives, 1915. Evening Public Ledger Archives, 1916. Fellow Museum, Illinois. Evening Ledger Public Archives, 1922. Encyclopedia the Morning Call Archives, 1940. Titanic Children, Eyewitnesses to History, edited by Anthony Cunningham. And the Palm Beach Post Archives, 1940. This video has been brought to you by me. Well, 
My Patreon is a sponsor for this video. If you like these dirty scandals on my channel, then you'll love my Patreon, Ty's Too Hot Hot Mess History. It has all of the stuff that I can't talk about or show here because it's just too hot, too violent, too sexual, too graphic, too much. Come and join us there for the hot, hot mess history. The link is in the description box. If you have a business, YouTube channel, or social media platform that you would like to promote to the hot mess history mess stories, email us at taiwan at taisaidwhattaisaid.com. We'll come up with a campaign that gives you visibility and fits your budget.